Hello everybody, so we are uh, talking about uh, media institutions again and we're wrapping up uh, with that uh, lecture. This is section seven. And so when I had uh, last left you, we were looking at consolidation and how the FCC had written all of these rules uh, in terms of how media companies can merge with one another. Uh, and the the rules of you can get bigger and bigger and bigger, but you know they would they would write the rules so that um, it tried to maintain some form of diversity of thought. Um, but again, it's really what's happening all along the way is that you're eroding those uh, those desires or goals to keep uh, a diversity of thought going on. Um, and I just noticed I have my little tag on uh, from Cub Scout Camp or Boy Scout Camp or whatever you want to call it. I'm very exhausted, so if I don't make sense in this uh, in this presentation, I came straight here from camping out for the last two days. But let's get going. So all those changes, what they did in effect was um, they made it so that. Uh, I'm sorry, I had trouble with my little mouse coming over here. Um, it made it so that all these companies uh, collapsed into bigger and bigger and bigger. They merged, they consolidated. So uh, if you look, what we have over the history of all these dealings is that um, 1983, you basically have 50 CEOs that control the majority of all media by 1992. That reduces down to 23. Uh, in 2000, um, we look at six firms, basically. So here's, here's where we see the biggest impact, I guess, of the Telecom Act of 96. Um, shortly after that, you've got all that, you know, 20 years ago, there was 50 CEOs. Now it's reduced down to six uh, major firms uh, in America. Bertelsmann, which is a German group, if you've ever heard of BMG as a record label, uh, that's Bertelsmann Music Group, so that's a, a German company, of course, Disney, General Electric, News Corp, Time Warner, Viacom, right? And so by 2015, the major players that you have are Comcast, Time Warner, Disney, Fox News Corp, Viacom, and CBS. And then we know that uh, throughout the year of 2017, you've had further mergers uh, like Disney trying and proposing to buy up Fox's uh, movie studio. So we can, uh, when we meet, we'll look at a media ownership chart and see what all is going on right now and what deals are pending. Um, you kind of still have these same players though, Comcast, Time Warner, Disney. Uh, Fox News Corp, Viacom, CBS. The thing that's changing right now is that these uh, these newer companies, the non-traditional companies, uh, are starting to become major, major media players like Amazon. Amazon's huge right now. Um, so if we look at how this works or why, why do people want to merge? Is it just to buy out the competition uh, and make sure that you have a higher profit or is it something else to it. Um, a lot of times those mergers are happening not just because they want to be the biggest and the, the best companies, but because by doing that they work more efficiently, so to say. And let me just explain some things here. We're talking about integrations. Uh, and by integration what I mean uh, is mergers, consolidations. And so there's some economic terms that we can talk about. We already talked about economies of scale and efficiency, if you remember, which is that you know, the more of something you produce, the cheaper per unit it becomes to produce that thing. Uh, mass production usually ends up in saving you over the long run. So here's some other economic terms. Horizontal integration. If you think horizontally, so you have one company and they're trying to buy up all the other little companies that compete with them, right? So they're all on the same level. So for example, if Krispy Kreme uh, decided that they wanted to buy out the rest of Shipley's, that's a horizontal integration. Uh, they're buying out their competitors. 
Uh, so, you know, if AutoZone decided it wanted to buy out um, Riley's Auto Parts, uh, and um, I'm trying to think of other auto companies, Napa, things like that, if if AutoZone decided it wanted to, to buy out its competitors, that's a horizontal integration, right? Um, and so we see that uh, in the media, you have companies that are trying to buy out uh, some of their other companies and for a lot of the most reason is they want the content um, for example like in the uh, the pending Fox uh, movie studio and uh, Disney uh, merger Disney wants uh, to be able to have that content that Fox owns um, and primarily because Disney is trying to set up a network that would ri that would rival Amazon Prime or Netflix. Uh, so it wants to set up its own little system like that. It still needs more and more content, right? If it's going to outmaneuver uh, Netflix or Amazon Prime, it's going to have a, it's going to need to have a lot of content. So it's trying to figure out the best way to buy up these companies that's competing with it. Uh, you know, Disney's not trying to buy all of Fox it just wants to buy their movie properties um, so uh, it's trying to to buy that content so that it can get the rights to show it uh, and charge money for that content uh, the uh, another example would be uh, record labels record labels are notorious for horizontal integration once uh, you have an independent uh, record label um, and it's kind of funny because we don't even say record anymore, but I guess a, a music label, right? Um, for example, Universal Music Group. Uh, uh, at one point, they had bought Interscope, Geffen, A&M Records, Capital Music Group, and Def Jam Recordings. So you would have some indie group, like when Def Jam first started off, which was a rap, hip-hop, uh, R&B uh, label. And so it's an independent um music group, record group, whatever you want to call it. And, you know, it eventually lands and finds a couple of good key artists that are making it uh, making it noticeable. Uh, it's, I wanted to say profitable, but it's hard to say profitable because for the most part, a lot of the music labels aren't profitable. Uh, but, uh, so it's, let's say this independent music label, it uh, gets its star, or two stars, or three stars, or a roster of stars, once it starts making enough money, there'll be a knock on the door where some big conglomerate uh, kind of uh, organization will come in and yank up that, that label, right? Interscope Records uh, kind of went through this, where they were, for the most part, an indie label, uh, Geffen uh, merges into with them, and then Universal buys that out and so you know you sit around thinking about how unique or independent a label may be but if you actually go digging around and seeing who owns the majority of stock in that company it's usually not an independent deal it's a major corporation that usually has ties into it so we see that a lot um, vertical integration is another thing so if you think about horizontal integration as everything that's happening at the same level, right? If you think about vertical integration, what you're doing is you are buying up, instead of everything that's on the same playing field, you're buying up rungs on the ladder that you need. So you're buying up, again, it's integration, you're buying companies, but those companies aren't, really, aren't necessarily direct competitors to you. They, on the other hand, produce things that can make it easier for you to do business, right? Of course, when we're talking about horizontal integration, if Krispy Kreme buys out Shipley's, then it makes it easier for Krispy Kreme to be the top company. Vertical is just going at it in other words, uh, in, in an, another way. So one of the things that I'd like to talk about with that is, uh, is looking at um, actually uh, alcohol, um, and breweries in particular. If you think about what Budweiser has to do, you know, Budweiser is the top selling beer in America. 
what does it have to do to put out that product okay well you have to first make the beer then you have to bottle the beer then you need to put some kind of label or packaging on the beer um, and included in that could be not just the label on the bottle but also you know putting it in that cardboard you know 12 pack or uh, case or whatever so you got that but if you think about the other things that make Budweiser uh, so popular you got to have a distributor you got to have a way to get the beer from your brewery out into the stores and that usually is not just a distributor it's a large-scale distributor or a small distributor so the beer goes to a, a big distribution facility and at that point it's divided out and sent to a medium level distributor who uh, who then divvies that up again and sends it out to its small uh, local distributors who are going to be the ones that put it actually on the truck and drive it to the convenience stores or the gas stations or the grocery stores or whatever. So you get the beer to the market. Now what do you have to do? Well you have to make sure that your product uh, is well known, uh, has a good reputation and basically you need to promote it. Uh, so you had advertising and advertising agencies that come in to promote the beer. Uh, marketing people that come up with commercials uh, for you to do, ads for you to do. Um, you know, somebody puts up a display in a convenience store. You know, you see those displays where they have cases of, of uh, beer around them. and Maybe it's a Super Bowl and it's a, a big stand-up cutout cardboard of a, of a football player. Someone has to put that up, right? So it takes a lot of different things to make that product successful. Now, if you could own all those processes, right? So if you could buy your own bottling company, your own labeling, your own packaging, your own distribution chain, your own advertising company, marketers, um, if you could own all of that yourself then you're going to save in those costs you because every time you uh, try to bottle it and you have to pay another bottling company to do it well of course they're going to take their percentage profit they're going to upcharge above cost so that they can operate as a business when you buy that bottling company yourself then maybe you can kind of shave the profit margin because at the end of the day everyone is uh, getting money off of the sale of Budweiser right so you can kind of cut profit margins on some of those individual uh, units hoping that at the end of the day the price of that beer and the sale of that beer supports the entire company now how do we apply that to media well you're going to see that uh, News Corp is an example that I use where News Corp is uh, they they own 20th Century Fox, right? So um, they have the movie studios. Now again, this is kind of a deal with Disney that's going on right now, so this can change. But 20th Century Fox is the movie studio, uh, but also Fox owns the Fox TV networks and the TV channels and everything that goes in with that. FX. Um, uh, FX movies, stuff like uh, different types of Fox channels. Of course you have Fox News, you have Fox Business News, you have these things that are going on. So you've got those channels that can promote the movie. Not only promote the movie, but also for example if that movie becomes, uh, once it gets out of the theaters and it's done making its money on rentals and all that, uh, those stations can air uh, the movie and the the licensing or, or rights uh, for the movie they're not going to cost Fox anything to show on their own network right whereas if you took a 20th Century Fox movie and tried to show it on um, you know NBC then you may have to pay more uh, so it reduces the cost you have magazines also that are owned uh, and newspapers that are owned within the News Corp industry. So New York Post, Wall Street Journal, those are 
publications that are on. So maybe the Wall Street Journal wants to write an article about, hey, here's this movie coming out, and oh, it makes so much sense in terms of uh, how businesses work and economics uh, works, and it's a good example of economics and, and things like that. If you stop and think about it, though, it's a News Corp uh, newspaper that's running an article on a 20th Century Fox movie, that corporation at the end of the day is the same corporation. So while it may read like it's a news article and telling you why things are so great, it could be just a glorified commercial if you think about it, right? Uh, at one point, News Corp owned a substantial stake in direct TV satellite, so think about that. If you've got 20th Century Fox has a movie out, uh, and it's just leaving the theaters and you want to put it on pay-per-view but you want to have it as a pay-per-view exclusive maybe you only put it on direct TV you don't uh, sell that pay-per-view to a cable company you don't sell that pay-per-view to Dish Network satellite uh, you restrict it only to direct TV um, so there's a, a host of things like that thing that can go on as media company starts to own all these cogs uh, in the wheel, uh, all these rungs of the ladder that it needs to be successful. Uh, as it buys those things, the cost goes down, and hopefully that means the profits jump up, right? So another type of integration we can talk about is conglomerate integration. This is when really big companies try to come in and buy media groups. Uh, media is very powerful. It's a mouthpiece. Uh, and, and what I'm trying to say by that is if you have a message you want to get across, uh, owning national media is going to help you very easily do that, right? So what we see is we see companies like Westinghouse at one point had bought CBS. General Electric had bought NBC. And so you're going to see these other things like an Amazon, which really isn't a media company but it wants to get into the media content business so of course it's going to try to buy up some stuff here uh, I think Facebook is trying to do the same thing where it's looking to see where it can buy content from the problem with for example Westinghouse owning CBS or General Electric owning NBC is that those industries uh, and your profit margins how much money you can make off profit and all that those industries are vastly different right I mean General Electric is trying to sell power transformers and uh, dishwashers or refrigerators or whatever. Um, they're an appliance company, a power uh, kind of related company, right? Uh, electricity and power and appliances that run off that. Um, so they know how to work that world, but they don't necessarily know how to work media content. What makes a good TV show? what makes a bad TV show, you know, um, what's going to make a good album, not a good album, a good, uh, you know, can you imagine, let's say NBC is doing a, uh, they like to do these live productions, um, uh, theater, musicals, whatever. Think about General Electric trying to decide, oh, well, what's going to be our next big live musical that we have? Well, General Electric doesn't know how to make those choices, right? So you end up seeing a lot of these conglomerate uh, integration. And so you have a corporation, and when that corporation grows to be really huge and it has all these different functions that it does, that's a conglomerate. And so uh, that conglo conglomerate decides, ooh, we want to buy this network, uh, this TV channel. Um, it usually doesn't work well. Another thing we can look at when we talk about uh, media companies and that you have to kind of be familiar with is this global implication uh, behind you selling your product, right? One thing that the Telecom Act of 96 also did was it made it so that American, through the internet, American companies could reach out overseas into other markets, right? Someone in China wants to buy something from Amazon, uh, they can attempt to do that. Japan wants to buy, Israel wants to buy, Russians want to buy. So it kind of, it, it really brought on 
what we tend to think of as, as globalism and corporate globalism right now. One of the issues that you have to look out for in that is this issue of cultural imperialism, right? We're not so good at fighting wars anymore militarily, right? We're not so good at going in, especially in the state of affairs that we're in today, it's awfully hard to defeat a mindset. Uh, in the old days of Nazis and, and uh, the Japanese and the Italians in World War II, there were definite armies and definite, uh, definite leadership structures, right? There were bases, uh, there were tanks, there were things you could physically destroy in order to win that war. Trying to kill a belief uh, and ideology is different and we've seen in recent years that it's really hard to try to win a war on that ideology. But cultural imperialism can work pretty good too. I mean if you think about all these wars that we're in with these other countries or uh, you know how we handle them, they have their own culture. They're raised in their own culture and I'll talk a little bit about this. I've got the the McDonald's picture there. Uh, I've got the little soccer balls that are Coke, actually Coca-Cola uh, bottles. I'll talk about that in class and and where I've seen cultural imperialism just personally. Um, all cultural imperialism is is saying that once you have these global businesses, these huge conglomerates, these media consolidated companies uh, working in other countries you got to think about what we're sending them. You know, we're sending them our TV show, which reflects and represents our values. But those values may not be shared values. Those values may be vastly different in China, Japan, Russia, Israel, Australia. Maybe there's a different set of values. But when we send that TV show and they watch that, they start looking at our values and if it's a popular show, they start saying we should adopt those values, right? Uh, hey, the characters on this show, they went to McDonald's. You know, I wish we had a McDonald's here. And then before you know it, that country has a McDonald's. I've seen it happen in Europe that way a lot. And so you have to think, well, how does that company, does that company kind of, is that a distribution point then for like, our culture and so what I'm getting at kind of is like this culture war uh, in that you know if a company wants an American product uh, or another country wants an American product there's a fear that you know that product may uh, may cause those people to to gain American culture gain American values um, a reverse way to talk about this that maybe will make it uh, a little bit uh, more understandable. Um, Al Jazeera is a Middle East uh, news company. Um, they're not heavily ideological. Uh, they're not trying to push like a message of down with America. Uh, in reality, a lot of journalism awards uh, a lot of recognition and credibility went to Al Jazeera um, because in Al Jazeera's mind we're, they're just a news company it just so happens to be that their headquarters is in the Middle East so they wanted to to branch out and get a global audience and they did that um, they became very successful and so uh, cable companies and satellite companies in America started to pick up Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera put a bureau in the United States so they had their own little location for reporters to go out and get American stories. Americans and uh, American media companies didn't like that so much. There was this feeling that okay we know that supposedly you're not in league with terrorists but the fact that you're Middle Eastern and you're giving us news uh, about things that are happening in the country now, it made people uncomfortable. Um, another example, Russia Today 
which is a television channel that uh, you can look at um, and maybe we'll look at some Russia Today um, in class but it's a, it's a news channel right only that it's not really just a news channel Russia Today is actually funded by the Russian military and the government of Russia so there's a lot of Americans that think it is very dangerous to have this station now the anchors look and sound as if they're from America overall the stories tend to seem as if they're neutral but there's a lot of people that say there's propaganda in those um, and the military in Russia it, it has actually been quoted as saying this is this is a weapon this is a tool just like a tank just like a jet uh, media news and just playing media all the time that's a tool well we've sat here discussing for the last year or so about how the Russians may have interfered into the election uh, so there might be something behind that so to speak and that uh, Russia Russia is using these things in media television channels Facebook posts things to kind of erode at our at our culture um, so it's it's an interesting thing to talk about that and there's there's been a lot of different articles that were written on you know how major wars may have been won more through culture than military force um, and that's kind of what I said is if you could instead of bombing every ISIS uh, place if we could just drop a million McDonald's uh, in, in that area in that country wherever it is you'd probably win you would probably erode their culture so badly um, they would see this McDonald's cheap food at any time uh, and, and it would probably just blow their minds uh, and you might see some of their cultural values start to disintegrate uh, so we can talk about that um, finally what I want to end up on and we're going to talk a lot about this in class too is where is the internet come to play in all of this well, I talk about TV stations and movie companies and record labels and blah 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 how does the internet fit into all of this and of course these companies are being bought up these internet companies we see cable companies that are just fully invested into internet uh, providers uh, right now you know your cable I don't know what population or what percentage of the population in America get their internet through their cable uh, subscription but um, the biggest thing perhaps when we talk about the internet and how things business wise might be changing how the industry might be changing is net neutrality now ever since I started teaching this course 13 14 years ago we talked about net neutrality what it was and that Congress seemed to every year bring it up and say you know uh, we want to talk about net neutrality and I'm going to explain what that is but the the key thing to note right now in this time is that it passed all those years it never passed uh, striking down net neutrality uh, this last year um, legislation to end net neutrality that passed so we're about we're on that beginning of future uh, the beginning of a new phase of the future really regarding um, how we understand the internet to work as a business right and how we handle our own internet subscriptions so let me back up tell you what net neutrality is net neutrality is just this belief that all traffic on the internet right sending messages watching movies sending email reading email um, anything that's going on on the internet 
it ought to be free to move about without any kind of roadblock or incursion. If I send you an email, the company that I get my uh, internet from, the company you get your internet from, those companies shouldn't intentionally slow down the receipt of my email that I'm sending to you, right? Um, it should travel as fast as the technology allows it. That's how, how we think the internet should work, is that the, the traffic that's on there, uh, it, it flows as fast as the technology can support that transmission. Um, and that no company should have better access to it than another company, right? If I send you an email and at the same time my wife sends you an email, there shouldn't be a huge reason why one would get there over the other. Those two emails, if we send them at the same time, hopefully they're going to arrive at the same time. But what if they don't? What if there is this thought that companies who give you the internet should provide who gets to travel fast and who is going to travel slow. Therefore the net's no longer being neutral. Things are being enacted on it, right? Um, what you got to think about is when we talk about the FCC government uh, regulating the government so much, we tend to think of, of that because of broadcast, right? The other day in class I said, who owns the airwaves that the radio gets transmitted on, that TV gets transmitted on, who owns the air above your head? And we were talking about issues of spectrum and I told you, well, the American people own that. That's the American people's. Um, the internet's not the same thing. Think about it. These, It's not getting to you through the airwaves, right? It's if the internet's coming to your house, why is it coming to your house? Because some company laid the wire, the fiber, the copper, whatever, from one of their junction boxes to your house. They wired your house up, right? And so it's it's a lot like electricity or water, in that um, it is traveling through some thing right whether it is whatever type of wire and not airwaves but the, there's companies that own that wire right if uh, if you order uh, internet service they come out and they bury their fiber in the ground in their conduit which is a conduit is just pipes that cables get passed through up under the ground they paid for the conduit. They paid for the fiber that goes to your house, right? That's vastly different than broadcasting airwaves. So these companies say, hey, look, we own how all this information is being transmitted. We own the wires, the Wi-Fi signal or whatever you're getting, right? We own that. And so we should be able to determine who gets priority in terms of traffic flow, right? So what happens is you have a company like um, Comcast that operates their own cable, right? So Comcast is, is both a, an internet provider and a cable television provider. Think about, let's say, um, trying to think of a movie that or the last Jedi okay so that's coming to its run in the theaters right um, let's say that it's going to show up on pay-per-view pretty soon Comcast can show that movie to you and charge you $4.99 whatever to see the movie to rent the movie for a day Comcast can do that you can flip it on your channel over your pay-per-view section and find that movie and click that you want to order it. Here's another thing. Disney has a really good deal with Netflix right now. And so you're starting to see movies like Rogue One 
of you know Star Wars not too old movie it popped up very quickly on Netflix right so now I'm talking about the competitor right you can you can pay $4.99 through your pay-per-view and get this movie and watch it right and then it expires it goes away you can't watch it again you can't record it you just paid to see it once that's $4.99 for that an Amazon subscription costs you $12, $13 a month I say Amazon or Netflix Netflix cost you twelve thirteen dollars a month and it's unlimited viewing as long as that movie is there so if that movie is there and you already have a Netflix subscription like me I'm not going to go now and pay Redbox or pay uh, Comcast pay-per-view I'm not going to pay to see Rogue One when I already have it on Netflix right but here's the trick. Comcast owns the internet subscription that you have, right? So if they decide, well, we're going to make Netflix run really slowly, you're going to be buffering for days. We were watching a movie today at Cub Scout Camp, and we get a horrible Wi Fi signal there, but someone wanted to show this movie that they had to stream, they had to buffer and it stopped every three four minutes and it just made people furious in there towards the end of it people just wanted to go home and the movie seemed to never finish so um, what if that starts happening because Comcast wants to sell you that movie on pay-per-view it does not want you to watch it basically for free on Netflix Okay. So Comcast starts throttling, what we call throttling. It starts slowing down the transmission of information from Netflix. So these cable companies, these internet providers now get to determine who's going to be running fast, who's not going to be running fast. And, you know, Amazon is great, and Amazon makes a ton of money right now. But if Comcast decided we don't like Amazon and we're going to stop the traffic from moving quickly at all, it's going to be really slow. It's going to frustrate you. Well, Comcast subscribers then, if they've got that internet and it's being throttled on Amazon, they're not going to go to Amazon anymore. They'll find somewhere else to buy their products from. And so you see these internet companies therefore can kind of pick winners and losers if it controls how information flows right same thing if you uh, from a consumer standpoint if you are watching Netflix 24 hours a day you are chewing through data right and if we think about using the internet on our phones where we have to stay within a data range usually versus how we use internet at the house which is we have a subscription to the internet so we just use it however we want there is no data cap right so you have some person that's paying thirty dollars a month for their cable and they're streaming Netflix all day long you have another person that's uh, being charged thirty dollars a month and they they really it's, it's my mom the only thing they really do is just look at email and go on Facebook and that's it they're not streaming movies downloading albums no just looking at Facebook right um, reading email now and then so that person's paying you that amount but they're using the service very little which means uh, that other traffic is flowing through quickly right um, but you may be watching Netflix so you're taking up a tremendous amount of data resources but you're still only paying the same amount what I'm trying to get here with is that one of the things that the internet companies want to do is for people who are using large amounts of data at home they want to be able to charge you for that or if they can't do that tell you okay well since you're such a heavy user we're throttling you down 
Max South just sent something out saying that they have this new product called a Wi-Fi in the sky or whatever. It's it basically is going to take portions of a city and put Wi-Fi transmitters basically on the utility poles so that your Wi-Fi is not coming to you from a box in your house but rather a box on a light pole and there's 15, 20 other houses that are actually taking their signal from there too. Excuse me. So it's um it's an interesting technology and they're advertising that to everybody. It's supposed to be faster too. So they're trying to sell everybody on this Wi-Fi in the sky or whatever it's called. But I notice at the very bottom of it it says uh, you know high data users may be prioritized uh, down in relation to uh, non-heavy users. So what they're saying is if they see that I'm using their Wi-Fi in the sky all day long to stream movies and video games and albums and all that stuff, if they have someone who's only using a small amount of data, they're going to throttle me down so that person can do more, right? So again, net neutrality and striking down that neutrality. Remember, neutrality was all information should flow uh, should flow freely. So when you disrupt that, when you disrupt net neutrality, you're you're making it so that cable companies can and internet providers can charge you more for your data or they can decide who's going to travel fastest and who's not going to travel so fast. Comcast may end up telling Amazon we'll make we'll, we'll make it so you can go really 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 fast. Okay? But you have to pay us. If you want us to make sure your content is not throttled, you pay us because we own the means of transmission, the wire, the fiber, the copper that makes that thing work. Okay. So we need to end now. I've gone longer, much longer than I thought I wanted to. Uh, and like I said, I'm, I'm starting to get to that point of exhaustion where I'm losing track of what I'm saying. Not a good thing. Sorry this is coming to you so late. I'm trying to push it out literally as fast as I can now, uh, for today especially. But I'll see you all in class. Have a good evening.